My name is Pat McFarlane. Uh, I teach in the philosophy department and in the development of Western Civilization program. Because Professor Hain is on sabbatical, he asked me to assist him this semester in moderating the forum. The forum is very pleased to welcome to campus today a distinguished guest, Professor Christopher Vesey. Professor Vesey is the Harry Emerson Fosdick Professor of the Humanities, Native American Studies, and Religion at Colgate University in Hamilton, New York, in wonderful central New York, I'll say, just in case you were wondering. Professor Vesey has taught at Colgate University since 1982, and he is one of the founding members of Colgate's Native American Studies program. His courses at Colgate have included American Indian religions, mythologies of tribal peoples, Navajo creation stories, North American Indians, the Iroquois, and Catholic traditions. Professor Vesey's scholarship focuses primarily upon American Indians. He is the author of five books about, about American Indian religions, including most recently the three-volume work, American Indian Catholics, published by the University of Notre Dame Press between 1996 and 1999. Professor Vesey has received grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Association of University Colleges, the John Ben Snow Foundation, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the American Philosophical Society, the Canadian Embassy, and the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism. Please join me, then, in welcoming Professor Chris Vesey to the Humanities Forum. Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you all very much for being here today. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Hain, uh, to Professor McFarland, to uh, Sandra Keating, um, and also to Pamela Belcher, who has made uh, the arrangements uh, for me. Um, and I want to thank Colin King, for anyone who knows Colin King. Uh, he's the reason I'm here, uh, but he's not here. He was a student of mine at, uh, at Colgate University, a beloved student of mine. And um, he apparently is doing everything he can to avoid me. Um, but you know, he went as far as Switzerland to, uh, to get away from me uh, today. So no, no problem, Colin, wherever you are. Um, so I want to uh, you know, thank you. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the Narragansett Indian tribe, uh, upon whose lands uh, Providence College is uh, presently situated. All right, so I teach at, uh, at uh, Colgate University. It's a different school uh, from uh, this one. It's uh, one where we're celebrating our uh, bicentennial right now. Uh, Colgate used to be a Baptist seminary uh, when it was founded in 1819. Uh, it's now a, uh, you know, a liberal arts uh, secular uh, uh, institution. Um, as Pat just said, I, I have two main things that I do at Colgate. One is that I teach in Native American studies. Uh, so I teach about American Indians in, in all kinds of ways. And then I also teach in the religion department. I'm chair of the department right now. Um, and I teach uh, about Catholicism, all right? So Catholicism and American Indian religions, you know, those are, those are my two areas of, of teaching. Uh, and I want to say that I try to uh, bring the same spirit of appreciative inquiry uh, to my classes on American Indians as I do uh, in my courses on Catholicism. And then I also want to say that I try to bring the same spirit of uh, appreciative in inquiry uh, to my courses on Catholicism as I do to my courses on American Indians. All right, so you know, two very different types of religious traditions, and in both of them I try to bring uh, the same kind of phenomenological method, which is to listen to what people say, to try and understand what people are saying about their own uh, traditions, and th this is what we do in our Department of Religion. So, um, in the 1980s, I uh, realized that there could be a perfect co-joining of my two interests. Uh, there was a conference that was taking place at uh, Le Moyne College in 1985. Uh, it's called the uh, National Tekakwitha Conference, and um, I realized that uh, I could be studying both American Indians and Catholicism in the same uh, in the same place in the same way. Um, and so I started to look at this organization and to um, uh, go around the country and into Canada. Uh, 
interviewing American Indians and uh, American Indians who are uh, Roman Catholics and uh, to see what American Indian Catholicism is like. And so the result is, uh, you know, five books about, about American Indian Catholicism, including the, the last one, which is called Native Footsteps. I have to look at it because it's such a hard title. Native Footsteps Along the Path of uh, St. Kateri Tekakwitha, uh, published in 2012. Uh, and I did that work with Mark Thiel, who is the archivist at um, Marquette University, where I've done uh, you know, some years of, of reading. It's a great, great archive, and Mark is a, a wonderful colleague. Okay, so I have this slide in front of me, and uh, you know, it has the name of the talk. Uh, in uh, October, October 21st, 2012, the Roman Catholic Church canonized uh, Kateri Tekakwitha, declaring her a uh, saint, recognizing her miraculous uh, sanctity. She is the first uh, American Indian Catholic uh, saint to be so declared officially uh, from the U.S. or Canada. Note that uh, Juan Diego, the legendary Mexican Indian, uh, who died uh, in 1548, uh, and who received the vision of Our Lady of Guadalupe in 1531, uh, was declared uh, a saint, uh, canonized in 2002. And there are other saints for other religious traditions. Uh, so the Russian Orthodox uh, Church has uh, Peter the Aleut, um, who is a, a martyr and died in 1815, and he was declared a saint uh, by the Russian Orthodox Church in 1980. And the Episcopal Church uh, has at least two, and there are actually more, but I'll just name two. Uh, there's a Cheyenne Indian named uh, David Pendleton Oker Hader, uh, uh, who died in 1931, and he was uh, declared a saint for the uh, Episcopal Church in 1985. And very dear to my heart, Reverend Samson Ockham, who is a Mohegan Indian Presbyterian, actually, uh, but uh, declared in 2010 a saint in the Episcopal Church, and, and Samson Ockham. Uh, was the leader of uh, a refugee uh, Christian group, the Stockbridge Indians, who moved from uh, Massachusetts to um, uh, New York, well, it wasn't New York State then, but you know, to Oneida Territory uh, in, right before the American Revolution. And um, he's buried you know, just maybe five or six miles from my house in a town called Deansboro, which used to be um, Stockbridge, uh, the Stockbridge Indian uh, Reservation, and the house that uh, my wife and I live in uh, was within that Stockbridge territory. So, uh, so different kinds of saints. We are all familiar, and I feel kind of foolish talking to this group about sainthood and Catholic sainthood, but I'm going to do it because you know it's just a way of of reminding us of what we're talking about here. So we're all familiar with sainthood within the Catholic tradition. Uh, it's part of the, the constant Catholic tradition uh, to venerate saints, to name our children after them, uh, to dedicate churches under their patronage, to invoke their names in prayer, to honor their memory in liturgy, and to seek out um, their example in living a Christian life. That is to say, to walk in their footsteps. All right? This is what it is to have saints. These are models of behavior uh, for us and models of sanctity. Um, my talk today is going to be uh, two parts. It's going to focus on uh, uh, Kateri Tekakwitha uh, as a person, as a historical person. You know, so I'm going to put her in her historical context, tell us about her. But I also am interested in the uh, devotional attachment that exists to her uh, by Jesuits, by non-Indians, but more, more importantly for me anyway, um, by American Indian Catholics. All right? So I'm going to look at her as a person, historical person. Who was she? What was she about? But what are the devotions to her? What role does she play in the spiritual lives of, of uh, Native American Catholics today? Uh, her footprints have been trail markers and touchstones of spirituality for diverse Native American Catholics, and that's, I, that's what I want us to see. All religions have models of sacrality. You know, all religions institutionalize responses to perceived divinity in human form. Uh, all religions look around and say, you know, who are the people who represent God on earth? 
in Christianity, of course, Jesus is, is the, perfect, uh, the perfect exemplar, the personal exemplar, the God-man. But from the beginning of Christian history, Christian pilgrims have traveled uh, to, uh, to see living saints. So uh, a colleague of mine, Georgia Frank, wrote a book called The Memory of the Eyes, a book about uh, early uh, Christian pilgrims who went to see living saints. What do they look like? Can we look into their eyes, see what they look like? What does a saint uh, look like? And Christian communities have passed down uh, stories about saintly personages in their own communities. All right, so listen to what I'm saying. American Indians have a saint in their community, and they want to tell about what she is like. Christians have been doing this from the beginning of, of Christian history. Who in our community represents the divine in this world? A reading of texts like uh, the Biblia, uh, Bibliotheca Sanctorum, or uh, the Acta Sanctorum uh, produced by the Society of Bollandists uh, and, other, and other texts suggest that there are about 10,000 saints recognized by Catholic communities around the world who see themselves represented in the communion of saints through special local members. Of course, everyone in heaven is a saint and everyone is called to be a saint. But these are examples of heroic holiness. Saint making has become uh, centralized over time. Uh, 993 is usually the date of the first papal canonization of, of Ulrich, Bishop of Augsburg, although some people will say there, there was one or two uh, existence before uh, 993. By 1634, the process was reserved completely to the papacy, right? So that you move from communities declaring saints to the papacy canonizing saints and declaring who are officially saints within the, um, within the Catholic Church. So there's always a balance between what the Vatican uh, has said and communities who are declaring their own local saints. They're, they're all they're local uh, models of divinity. In 1917, the Code of Canon Law uh, made it very clear that there were three stages of the process by which one is declared a saint. Uh, one is uh, looked at as venerable, uh, one then becomes blessed, and then one is canonized. Right? So these three steps uh, were in place you know, really by the 1600s, but by 1917 put into the Code of Canon Law. And uh, in 1983, when Pope John Paul II uh, had a reform of the, of the process by which uh, people are, are examined for sainthood, there were only about 300 official papal canonizations by that time. And uh, Pope John Paul II opened up the process to a greater number, and uh, today there are uh, over 800 uh, canonized Catholic saints. All right, so 800 ca canonized Catholic saints and we're talking about one of them. So, you know, it's just one out of 800 or, or one out of 10,000, if you will. But, you know, one out of 800, that's a big thing. I, we're talking about an American Indian saint who is one out of 800 canonized Catholic saints. And this is a very important thing for her own people, the Mohawks, the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse, uh, and uh, for American Indians in general. So, who was she? I just show you this map um, just to indicate uh, where she was born and where she lived her whole life. So, um, so she was born uh, south of uh, Gandwage, uh, that's the Mohawk River Valley. Um, so she was born in a, in a village um, it's said to be now Auriesville, but it is actually a village about five miles away from Auriesville. Um, and so she lived her life in this area. This is the place where she encountered uh, Jesuit missionaries for the first time. And as I'll tell you later, 
she traveled north to a place called Ganawage, uh, where she uh, lived the rest of her life and where she died. All right? So uh, this, is, this is where she lived. I think she is best understood in her historical circumstance. So I want to say this about her. Hers is a Mohawk story. Right? She was a Mohawk Indian from the time she was born to the time she died. She never stopped being a Mohawk person. She spoke only one language, which was Mohawk, one of the Iroquoian languages. Remember, I'm in Native American studies as well as in religion, right? So I'm interested in her as a Native person, as a, as a representative of her people. Her life was lived in the midst of colonialism, colonial trade. Her people were in the midst of a conflict between New Netherlands and New France. All right, so just picture this. There is a fur trade. The Dutch had a, a, a trading post called Fort Orange, now called Albany, and furs were brought from this area, brought to Fort Orange, down the Hudson River to New York City, shipped to the Netherlands. The French focused in Montreal um, and uh, Trois-Rivières and Quebec and Tadoussac further north. They also had trading partners, Algonquins and further west, the Hurons on Georgian Bay. And they were trying to bring furs, all right, so these are beaver furs and other types of furs, by the millions. And they were competing the French and the Dutch, for this entire area. And when I say competing, I mean waging war on each other, killing each other, trying to bring Indians into their sphere of influence so that the French wanted those goods to go up the St. Lawrence to France, and the Dutch wanted those goods to go down the Hudson River uh, to the Netherlands. And I will say that after 1664, the British defeat the, um, the Dutch, and, the, and this area becomes a, an English area rather than a Dutch area. So Cattery was born into this maelstrom of competition for furs. And within that, there were two things that the uh, French wanted to do with these uh, Mohawk Indians. They want, you know, so they often sent troops down. In 1666, they sent troops down, and they created what's known as the Mohawk Apocalypse. They reduced all of the Mohawk villages in the Mohawk Valley to ashes. They wanted to pacify them, and they wanted to evangelize them. There were also diseases that were spread, eruptive diseases that did not exist in the New World. Uh, some people estimate that in American Indian societies, the diseases that were brought to the New World um, killed up to 95% of the population of the Americas, smallpox and other diseases. So Cattery was born into a highly problematic age, highly problematic age. Let me tell you a little bit about her and her name. Um, her mother uh, was an Algonquin Indian. See the Algonquins up here, all right? So Algonquins and Montagne and other Indians uh, belong to the Algonquian speaking family. Uh, these are Iroquois people. Uh, these are the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse, uh, and they speak uh, uh, um, Iroquoian languages. Her mother was a captive, uh, probably captured in the great warfare that took place between 1649 and 1654, where the Iroquois attempted to take over the Hurons and their traders, their trading allies. So they invaded the Huron area. Uh, killed them by the thousands, 
and adopted them by the thousands. And when I say adopted, I mean they took them captive and brought them back into their own villages and made them parts of their communities. Right? They had a whole adoption ceremonial that took place where a person replaced someone who had died in the community. And uh, this Algonquin mother of, of uh, Cateries uh, was one of these uh, Algonquin captives who was brought into the uh, Iroquois community, the Mohawk community, and was made a member of the Turtle Clan, and she married a Mohawk man. Right? So she was a captive, an adoptee. She is sometimes described as a slave among the, among the Mohawks. In 1660, so, so Cattery was born in 1656. In 1660 to 1662, a smallpox epidemic uh, raged through the Mohawk uh, villages, and her, um, her mother and father both died, and she was uh, attacked uh, brutally by that, uh, by that disease. Uh, her eyesight almost disappeared. She was almost blind. She couldn't stand having light, and so she's often pictured uh, with uh, some kind of a, a, a blanket or something over her head so she, you know, so she could keep the sun out of her eyes. And her very names, right, so, you know, her name, um, Degaguita, Degaguita, Tekakwitha, uh, it is in folk etymology presented as she who pushes with her hands or who walks groping for her way. More recently, I see it said that her name it means one who gathers things in order. This is a reference to the fact that she needed to walk around and grope where she was going. Her eyesight was so bad. But some people say that it also refers to her hands. She was a, a worker, uh, very skilled in uh, beadwork, um, in making uh, baskets and other designs, right? So she was that kind of uh, you know folk artist within her community, right? So known for her work with her hands, putting things in order with her hands, but also groping with her hands. She is said uh, after her parents uh, died that she was put into her uncle's household. Um, Highly problematic because uncles didn't have households among the Mohawks. Women had households, so she would have been put into her aunt's house, not into her uncle's house, because uncles, they, men don't own households. All right, so she would have been put into a, a matrilineage. The, 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 um, the Mohawks are matrilineal uh, and matrilocal, and so she was taken from her uh, parents who have died, and she was raised as an orphan. Um, by these other people. Okay, um, in 1666, the, uh, the French, as I said, uh, came into the Mohawk villages and uh, burned them down. And in 1667, uh, Jesuits entered the Mohawk villages to complete the pacification and begin the evangelization process of the Mohawks. And it would have been at that time in this village Gandwage, right, which is said today to be Fonda. It's not exactly Fonda. It's a few miles away, but it's very close to it. Um, but on the north side now of the Mohawk River, this would have been the first time that, um, that, Cat, that Tequitha would have seen uh, a Jesuit. And for nine years, she was quite interested in what the Jesuits taught her. She became uh, you know, a, 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 a baptized uh, member of of the Catholic community in 1676, um, baptized by Father James Lamberville, um, who mentions her in, in the Jesuit relations. So we see her first mentioned as a, as a person. And her conversion, you know, her baptism, uh, alienated her from her family and from her community. And she was uh, uh, very much an outcast in her community. A year later, under the beckoning of her sister, so she had an older sister who lived in Ganawage, she traveled to Ganawage and escaped from the Mohawk community 
into which she was born. Ganawage was a reduction. Right? It was a Jesuit reduction. It was a village uh, produced by the Jesuits under Jesuit rule in which Indian peoples who were um, bereft or who were in diaspora or who were refugees or whose communities were falling apart could go and their territory was reduced. They were, you know, the reduction brought them into a smaller area where they engaged in Catholic life. So this was a Catholic Jesuit village uh, right near Montreal and, uh, and uh, Cattery, she was uh, baptized as Cattery, named after St. Catherine of Siena. Um, it's where she went. And by doing that, she left her Mohawk people. Now, there were also Mohawk people here, but this was the center of Mohawk power and community. By going to Ganawage, she was entering a new zone of life. And this is where she lived the last few years of her, of her life. It's there that she met uh, Pierre Cholinac and, um, and uh, Claude uh, Chauchoutier, uh, these two Jesuits, who wrote uh, voluminously about her uh, in, over the next uh, few decades. She impressed them so much with her pieties, with her devotions, uh, with her virtues, she was said to be an angel of charity in the village. She went to mass frequently. She attended catechism. She went through the stations of the cross. She prayed with, with the rosary. That she received first communion on Christmas Day in 1677, all right, just a few months after arriving in the village. They were so impressed with her that they were ready to uh, have her receive her first communion. In 1678 and 79, in the winter, she went on a hunting expedition with a group of other uh, uh, Mohawks and other Iroquois people. And on that, she was accused of uh, sexual impropriety. Uh, you know, someone said that they saw her you know, sleeping in the same uh, mat with, with a man. Um, and she was so horrified by this notion that she would be accused of this that she determined that she would become a heroic virginal Christian woman. And she proved that for the rest of her uh, short life. She took up this ascetic discipline, or these, the, the set of ascetic disciplines, fasting, flogging with red whip, all right, the, as, the, as the Mohawks refer to it, it's, a, it's red willow. Uh, they use it themselves uh, sometimes uh, for, um, for whipping. Uh, sleeping on a bed of thorns, uh, walking in the winter on the ice with, without uh, shoes on, wearing iron belts, eating ashes. Some say that she was uh, imitating the, the nuns in Montreal. Um, other people say well, she was combining some Iroquois uh, activities that, you know, activities of self-abnegation, of self-mutilation, uh, and combining them with, uh, with Catholic uh, self-abnegation, right? So she was doing both of these things. She was being Mohawk, but she was also imitating the nuns in, um, in Montreal. Uh, she uh, joined with a group of other uh, Iroquois women in the community, what they called the slavery of the Blessed Virgin. Right? They wanted to be slaves to the Blessed Virgin, and they wanted to prove their heroic sanctity. Uh, Father Sholenek tried to calm her down, said, you know, don't, don't go too far, but she could not be stopped in what she wanted to do. She wanted to prove that she could have the discipline to overcome bodily desires. She took a vow of perpetual um, uh, sexual abstinence. And in um, uh, 1680, during Holy Week, uh, on, on, when she was 24 years old, uh, she died. And you know, one could say that she died of, of her ascetic activities, if you will. You know, she did without and did without and hurt herself. And she died at the age of 24. 
how do we know all of this? Like, how do we know all these things about her? We know them because the Jesuits wrote about her, right? These two Jesuits wrote about her. Um, this obscure, illiterate, Mohawk-speaking young woman, she left only her body and very few personal effects. But today there are over 300 books written about her. Um, historian Alan Greer says that her life, I'm quoting here, is more fully and richly documented than any other indigenous person of North or South America in the colonial period. All of the primary documents about her are hagiographical. Right? That is, they all treat her as a saint. They are all about her virtues. Uh, there's a little bit by Lamberville. Um, uh, there are the works by Cholinec and uh, Chauchetier that were published in the Jesuit Relations. Indeed, everything I have told you comes from those sources because they are the only primary documents we have about her. We have this painting that um, Chauchetier is said to have painted of her um, in sometime between 1685 and 1690. And let's just take a look at it. So there she is. She has her, uh, her blanket over her head. She is not a nun. She's not wearing a veil, right? Although that is obviously something that, that the artist is trying to get across. Uh, you see her with a cross in her hand in a saintly pose. You see her Indian moccasins there. This church, well, who knows what the church is. And, you know, some say, well, there was a church in Quebec uh, that was built in 1687 that might have looked like that, but no one really knows exactly what it looks like. But maybe it's that church that they're trying to show. And I have to say that although this is the, you know, this is the sort of official uh, painting of her and said to be painted by Chauchetier, uh, art historians today are really saying it, he did not paint this. This is a later painting that he probably did paint something of her, but this is not it. Right? This is a later uh, version, someone imagining her in, in, a, in a certain way. All right? But this is, this is the way she is imagined in this particular painting. What happened after her death is as important to her as a personage as what she did during her lifetime. At the moment of her death, Cholinec and Chauchetier said, all of the pock marks of smallpox disappeared from her face. Her face was transfigured into a face of clear beauty. And they said all of the, the Catholic Iroquois people who were with her all sat around her, and they were amazed at her, and they could see that she was something special right at that moment. And she appeared in visions um, to uh, one of her closest associates, Marie Therese, uh, uh, and said to her, I am on my way to heaven now. So this miraculous clearing of her face, a community regarding her with piety and seeing her as a person worthy of devotion, her visionary visits to her, uh, to her compatriots, all created a kind of, if I can use that word, a cult to her. And the Jesuits were the keeper of the cult. And I, I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. I, you know, the word cultus in Latin means a focus of devotion. It's where you go to find the divine. Right, so there is cult that takes place, and the Jesuits are the ones that, um, that put her fo forward. They wondered whether they should put her forward as an object of devotion, because after all, she was only an Indian. But, and they said that. They said, you know, th this woman, she was just an Indian. We shouldn't be worshiping an Indian. We shouldn't be offering veneration to her. But they said she was so amazing that she was worth the cultic activity, worth the devotion. 
And so they decided to perpetuate her memory. They wrote at length about her. This is how a person becomes a canonized saint, is that someone puts you forward. Someone says, this is who she is. This is who she was. This is, who, this is what she did. This is how she lived her life. This is the sanctity of her existence. And so the Jesuits put her forward, and I, I always found it interesting that I'd be reading books about uh, Catholic uh, missionaries in, in um, Mexico or in, um, uh, in Arizona, and I would read about not Jesuits, but uh, Franciscans telling about, about this woman, Cattery. So her story was being told throughout missionary uh, Catholicism in the um, in the. Uh, 1700s and 1800s, and actually into the, into the 19th century. Her Iroquois community, her Mohawk community, did not take part in the kind of healings that were attributed to her. So French Canadian people would come, and they would come to her tomb and seek healings right, for, for their diseases. But the Mohawks didn't do that. The Iroquois did not regard her right away as someone who could generate that kind of healing power. But they did revere her, and indeed, when their community at, at uh, Ganawage, I'm going to come back here for a second, if I can. Um, uh, yeah, just come back here. Um, so when this community uh, split off and another um, Mohawk community formed over here at a place called Aquasasne. Um, they brought, sorry to say, half of her body with her. So they divided up her body um, so that they would have her with them. So even though they didn't look to her for cures, they were very much in reverence of her and wanted her to stay with them um, over, that, over that time. All right, I'll come back here and just leave us with her, with her picture. In the 19th century, after the Jesuits who had been banned between 1773 and 1814 and came back into existence, um, in the early uh, 19th century, as they spread their missions throughout North America, they brought her story with them. And by the late 19th century, she was getting to be known in all of the Catholic Indian missions where the Jesuits were. In the 1880s, the Jesuits organized these, these Indian Catholic communities to write petitions to the Vatican asking that she be considered a saint. Right? So these are Indian communities writing these, these documents, but it's the Jesuits who are telling them what to write. And at the Third Plenary Council in Baltimore, um, it was argued that she should become an object of veneration in the church. And so uh, the bishops at the Plenary Council in 1884 and 1885 uh, created two shrines to her, uh, one at Ganawage and the other at Orisville in the Mohawk River Valley, right? So right where she was born, and the other one at Ganawage. So there are these two places now where people could go and, um, and venerate her. In 1938, uh, a shrine was created to her in Fonda, New York, uh, right near the place where, uh, where she first met the Jesuits um, in, in, uh, in 1667. To this day, these two uh, shrines, the one at Fonda and the one at Orisville, are often seen as competing shrines by American Indian Catholics. American Indian Catholics much prefer to go to Fonda, which is her shrine. The shrine at Orisville is to the Jesuit martyrs, and her shrine is within it, and they're far more ambivalent about that shrine. They, they like to go to Fonda. They feel that that's her place, and they want, they want to go, but they go to both of them. 
By 1940, a positio was created. All right, so this is a document that puts forward historical uh, material about her that can be uh, looked at by uh, the Congregation of Rites in the old days and now the congregation that looks at uh, the causes of saints to see whether her life is worthy of veneration. And in 1943, she was indeed declared venerable, right? uh, worthy of dulia, worthy, of, uh, worthy of, of veneration. All right, so now I'm going to show you uh, a bunch of uh, pictures. All right, so I've talked about the official process um, up until 1943. I want you to see that around the country, Indian communities started to uh, pay attention to her. So uh, Zuni Indians, uh, Zuni Indians um, in 1933, putting on a play right, under, under Franciscan uh, uh, observation, a play uh, about the lily of the Mohawks. All right, so here are Zuni Indians in Arizona putting on a play. See, you know, what is it to relive her life, to talk about her life? And Choctaw Indians in uh, 1934 yeah. carrying a picture of her. All right, a, you know, a, a painting or a, a copy of a painting. All right, Choctaw Indians in Mississippi on the Pine Ridge Reservation at uh, Holy Rosary Mission among the uh, Lakota, the Lakota Sioux, uh, a play also being put on in which the actors are, are Lakota Indians, uh, high school students, who are reenacting uh, her life, called the Princess of the Mohawks. Cattery societies, prayer societies, sodalities were formed in Iroquois communities all across the western part of the United States. Uh, these are Coeur d'Alene uh, Indians, uh, women all on their knees praying the rosary and uh, with a statue of Cattery. Right? So she is becoming a personage who brings them to Catholic devotions. All of these happening in the 1930s and 1940s. And what about within, um, within Cattery's homeland? All right, so in 1950, we see a, a photograph of Mohawk Indians. So just so you know, Mohawk Indians from Ganawage become high steel workers starting in the 1890s. They build bridges all across Canada, and then they build skyscrapers all across the United States, and especially in New York City. You know, these are guys who get up on girders, you know, a thousand feet up and walk across them, and, you know, and they are just amazing human beings. And they create a, a community in New York City, in Brooklyn, and uh, so this is a picture of some of those uh, Brooklyn um, steel workers, sorry, um, I'll come back here. Um, steel workers bringing uh, a bridge Right, they've made a, a bridge, and they are presenting it to a picture of Cattery, you know, a statue of Cattery on the, um, on the uh, Ganawage Reservation um, in 1950. So we see at mid-century, mid-20th century, all around the United States and in Canada, Indian Catholics under missionary influence are taking up devotions to Cattery matching the attention paid to her in mainstream Catholicism, and here's the picture I keep going to, that is in uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral. All right? So this is the way she is presented in St. Patrick's Cathedral. You know, very gaunt looking uh, uh, cattery in this picture. I remember seeing this here when I was a kid, um, going to St. Patrick's Cathedral and, you know, and looking on on her, Kateri is what we called her, you know, Kateri, Tekakwitha, um, back then. Um, 
1939, a missionary organization was formed called the Tekakwitha Society. And it was, a, it was a group of missionaries who were doing American Indian missions. And they, uh, they wanted to name it after her. By the 1970s, that organization, the National Tekakwitha Conference, had been taken over partially by American Indians, American Indian Catholics, particularly under the uh, inspiration of Red Power. And it became an organization for enculturation, particularly under the influence of the Second Vatican Council. This notion that the Catholic faith should take form in all the cultures of the world. And the Tekakwitha Society, the Tekakwitha uh, Conference, is a society that is, engages in um, enculturation of the gospel in native life. And since the 1970s, its purpose has been to promote her cause, to proclaim native kinship with her, to increase devotions to her, to use her as a model for, um, for co-joining Indian identity and Catholic spirituality. It's also a vehicle for Catholic Indian agency, right? so Indians can express themselves, so it, it's used by the official church to do things for her cause and for Indians, but it's also a way for Indian people to gather together. Uh, I remember being on a bus with a group of Mohawk Indians who were going to one of these conferences, and they said, oh yeah, we love this. We call this our take a week off conference. All right, so you know, so it has a social, it has a social. See, I told you, I had one little, one little joke, you know, a, a take a week off conference. Not bad, don't, don't you think? Yeah. Um, all right, so, um, so it's a vehicle for Catholic Indian identity and for social life, and it meets annually. There are, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 Indian Catholics who join every summer. This year it'll be in Cincinnati. I, I plan to be there. In 1980, uh, uh, Cattery was declared blessed on the strength of the facial transfiguration that, take, that took place, right? So this was regarded as, as miraculous. I, of course, had been aware of her since childhood, um, but following her beatification, I saw that I wanted to understand American Indian Catholicism as the living place where two roads of spirituality met. Indian spirituality and Catholic spirituality, because that's where the Tekakwitha Conference is, has been headed. It's a place where Indians can express themselves as Indians and as Catholics. And so uh, the, the crossing of these two roads, the meeting of these two roads, is, is an image that I've used in, a, in several of um, my books. And I see that she is a kind of manipulable symbol used by the church used by Catholic Indians. She serves the purposes of both the hierarchical church and the Indian communities of Catholics. And the two are not always on the same page. Right? Their relationship, Indian communities and the Catholic Church, is one that is often fraught with um, regret and with um, uh, disappointment. Catholic sister, uh, Marie-Therese Archambault, a hunk papa Lakota woman with whom I worked uh, for several years. She's now deceased, sister of charity. She said, as a native Catholic, the very faith you embrace is one that was used to destroy you, that collaborated with the government in cultural genocide. This is the terrible irony of being a native American and Catholic. And so I wondered, does Cattery as a saint offer the possibility to mediate these tensions that are felt within Indian communities? So certainly since 1980, her uh, devotions to her have just grown and grown and grown. And I'm just going to show you again some pictures. Um, so here is uh, Bishop Palat, uh, uh, unfortunately now deceased, uh, Abenaki uh, Bishop. Um, who said that Cattery had, quote, virtually been adopted by all Native Americans throughout the country. He was bishop of Gallup, New Mexico, and he said especially in the Southwest where he was bishop, uh, she was being adopted. 
you know, adopted by Catholic Indians, and he said adopted by Indians, not just Catholic Indians, but Indians. They were seeing themselves in her. And we found, especially in the Southwest, in Pueblo communities, so this is from Hemes uh, in 1989, that her image was enshrined in their churches and in their communities. Right? So they were taking her up. They were adopting her. And the, uh, and the official church, uh, so this is uh, the cathedral uh, in Santa Fe. They created, they had a native artist create this this statue of her that is outside the church. So since 1980, there has been a tremendous move to recognize her, to honor her, to put shrines in, in uh, Indian people's houses. Um, this is a, an Isleta and Oneida uh, Indian priest. Um, his name is Edmund Sevilla. Should be Sevilla, but he pronounces it Sevilla, um, who offered her as a symbol of hope for Indian people. He said that for Indians who have so much trouble with alcohol, here is a woman who had self-control, who could control the body. She should be a model of behavior for her. And she is a native woman, he said, who never left her traditions, who was always a Mohawk, who was true to her people all the way through. And so he said she could be a, a woman that all American Indians could follow under her banner. And indeed, this is the kind of thing that happens at the, at the Tekakwitha conferences. Every year they have all of these banners and at the beginning of the, of the events that take place, um, it, all of the different native communities, Catholic communities, come around. So there are Passamaquoddies here um, and, um, uh, and uh, St. Regis Mohawk people who are joining under her banner. Uh, carrying her banner. And we have uh, uh, Papago, uh, Tohono Odam, people doing a basket dance with their beautiful baskets in veneration of Kateri. Right? All of this is taking place at the, at the Tekakwitha conference. And other Indians from the Southwest um, are doing, you know, in this case from Laguna Pueblo, doing an eagle dance. So you see that they are joining their Indian culture with veneration to, uh, to Kateri as, as a person that they want to focus their attention on. And Eastern Cherokee, the Kateri Circle, Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. Well, this has all the, all the pieces there. Guadalupe and Kateri, it's got everything working for them there. All right, so all of these people at these Tekakwitha conferences are uh, seeing her as someone that they can focus their Christian and Indian attention on. And, one sees at different uh, Tekakwitha conferences shrines that are put up to her. Uh, this is a, a Sioux uh, Lakota uh, quilt, a star quilt, with all of the uh, candles and all of the images and baskets and, and pottery and so forth, all devoted to her. All right, so all of this happens. There's a proliferation of images to her. So I want to say some things about um, contemporary forms of devotional expression that I have seen at these Tekakwitha conferences. I remember seeing one woman one day, one Indian woman, who went up to a banner of Kateri, and she went over to the, the I don't ever have a camera, so I, I never take pictures of anything, um, so I'm just going to describe it to you. She went over to this banner with a picture of Kateri, and she took her hand and she went along the face of Kateri, just outlined her face. And then she went to her own face. And she was identifying herself physically. My face, your face, we are both the same person. I'm identifying myself with you. And so I see that happening at these uh, Tekakwitha conferences, an identification particularly for women. You know, this, this Indian woman, we're Indians, she was an Indian, and we have something in common. There was a, an Assiniboine a priest named Jim Nesbitt who I heard once say, by God, she is one of us. And the audience was, yes, that's correct, she's one of us. She's one of our community. She's a saint, but she is us. 
For some Indians, she is us because she suffered. Because she was a refugee. Because her people lost her land. So she takes up the kind of suffering that Indian people regard as their lives. They regard themselves as suffering people. But they also regard her as the mediator between the divine and them. She is someone they can come to. They have shrines in their houses. When they are ill, they turn to her. I remember a Mohawk man, Earl Dion, who uh, I've met many times, talk about her and the car accident he was in and how he was uh, quadriplegic and he prayed to her. Um, and although he was not completely healed, he says, I have been healed. I can now move around. I can still, I can make my way in, in the world. And it's because she is a conduit of God's power to American Indian people. All right, so I see this identification with her as a mediator of grace, as a symbol of self-love, as a, someone who delivers them from, uh, from suffering. She is also a symbol of pan-Indian unity. She, this Indian, joins us, all our different Indian tribal peoples. We're all Indians with her. She is a muse for inspiration. You have Indian people creating artwork and poems and songs, all kinds of things under her inspiration. I mentioned miracles, and I uh, can't close today without um, talking about uh, the way in which she became a canonized saint. So. Um, it happened because in 2006, a Lummi Indian from uh, Washington State uh, was playing basketball, a little kid. I think he was five years old at the time. His name is Jake Finkbonner. And uh, he, he fell down while he, was, while he was playing basketball, and he scraped his face. And somehow, he got a bacterium in his face. It's, um, it's a particular thing called strep A, or it's called necrotizing fasciitis. It's also often caused a skin-eating disease. And his face started to disappear. His skin was just rotting from his face. No one could do anything for him. The doctors you know, were trying to save his life. He was now in a coma, and they just assumed that he was going to die. And uh, a woman named, um, oddly enough, uh, Sister Cattery, Sister Cattery Mitchell. She's a Mohawk Indian um, from uh, the St. Regis Mohawk Reservation. Um, and uh, she brought a, um, a relic. Right, a relic, as you, as you see. This, this is Sister Cattery right here. This is Jake Finkbonner. That was his family with other priests. And she brought it to him and placed it on him, and he recovered. Right? He had several more operations. His face will never completely recover. But just picture it. Here is this boy with this, with this bacterial disease on his face being cured by a woman who suffered from a bacterial disease that disfigured her face. Everyone saw this as the perfect parallel. And as this was investigated by the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, they interviewed the doctors, none of whom were Roman Catholic. And I say, they said to them, we have no idea why, she, why this boy recovered. We regard this as a miraculous cure. And it was on the basis of that cure that she was uh, declared a saint. Right. The canonization uh, took place because she had um, uh, cured this boy of this disease. And I remember being in Albany in 2012 at the, at the annual Tekakwitha conference, um, right before she was being canonized. And, um, and the family was there. Jake Finkbonner was there. Uh, in fact, maybe this is a picture from, from that event. And, um, and as she, he and his family entered the room, you know, you know, a thousand people, Indian Catholics and others, standing up and applauding and crying to see this amazing, miraculous 
boy take place. The one uh, Homa Indian from Louisiana, Pierre Soleil, uh, said, um, it's our miracle family. It's our miracle family. And he was, of course, invited to go to the, um, to the canonization. And here he is receiving the Eucharist uh, on October uh, 21st, 2012. Uh, so there he is. Um, OK, I have one last thing I'm going to talk about. Right? I want to return to the Mohawks. And I just want to say a few things about what the Mohawks think about, about Kateri. Uh, over the years, Mohawk people have um, revered her. They have also resented her. Some Mohawk people have regarded her as a traitor, as a turncoat, who left her people in the Mohawk Valley to join the Jesuits to do something different. Right? They have some ambivalence about her as a, as a human being. Some see her as a symbol of spiritual conquest and oppression. Some, some have even said, she didn't even exist. These guys made her up. They, they created this story about her, which I don't believe at all. Um, but there are also many modern Mohawk stalwarts, advocates for her. I just want to show you some pictures of them. So these are Mohawk Indian women. Um, these are ladies at the Orisville Shrine uh, in 1990. Uh, these women pray to her. They pray for her. They are devoted to her year in, year out. And they often sing uh, songs, uh, hymns. So Mohawk is a, is a um, liturgical language. Right? So mass can be said in, in Mohawk language, and uh, the women uh, and it's one of the things that has actually kept the Mohawk language alive. Right? It's more alive than any of the other uh, Iroquoian languages. Um, and so you know, they love singing uh, hymns uh, to her and about her. This is on her feast day in Fonda in 1992. Uh, Indian people come to Ganawage to her tomb, where at least half of her body is. Um, and so, you know, so she is still very much there. Um, there are there are Mohawk women like Sarah Hassenplug. This is Julie Daniels. Um, two women who have enacted. Uh, Google them. You'll find you'll find uh, uh, videos of them where they take from the positio her life and they speak it out. They act out her life uh, as an act of devotion. I saw Sarah Hassenplug do it. I've seen Julie Daniels do it and. Uh, Wonderfully, I've seen Teresa Steele do it. Teresa Steele is an Algonquin Indian. Right? All these Indians live in, um, in Syracuse. They, go, they belong to St. Lucie's Parish, which is a, a, a parish that has a strong native um, uh, contingent in it. And Teresa Steele is an Algonquin. And at the 2012 uh, Tekakwitha Conference, right before the canonization, uh, she, she presented for the first time her version, Sarah Hassenplug had died, Julia Daniels was too old, didn't want to do it anymore. And they said, look, you're an Algonquin. Her mother was an Algonquin. We need to share her with you. And there was a ceremony at the, at the 2012 event in which Mohawk women and, uh, and men and, uh, and uh, Algonquins had a ceremony in which they said, we're going to share her as a person. She's as much an Algonquin as she is a Mohawk. And so here's, here's Teresa Steele, who, who acts out the life of, of Kateri. And of course, you have people like uh, Sister uh, Kateri Mitchell, who has been head of the, uh, the, Tekakwitha, the National Tekakwitha Conference. She isn't anymore, but she has been um, uh, for many years. I'm going to skip over that and just say that here are three Iroquois women, uh, Joanne Shenandoah and Diane Shenandoah and, uh, and Leah Shenandoah, who are singing in the Vatican at the, um, uh, at the canonization. Uh, they are not Catholics, but they are Iroquois people, and they wanted to to be invited, and they were invited. And I have to say that traditionalists among the, the Haudenosaunee were not happy about that. They were not happy about that. 
Um, so, you know, all kinds of interesting things have, have happened, and I uh, close with two, two last people. Here's Tom Porter. Uh, Tom Porter is a Mohawk revivalist. He's a, what you'd call a traditionalist. He was born at, Gano, at, uh, sorry, at St. Regis uh, Mohawk Reservation, now called um, uh, Akwesasne, and he wanted to establish a homeland where his people had been. And so he uh, had given to him a, a plot of land right next to Fonda, New York, right next to the shrine where Cattery is, where he does uh, a Mohawk uh, language immersion and cultural immersion. And this is what he says. He says, it breaks my heart to see family members devoted to Cattery. It breaks my heart. That saint stuff doesn't have any value in our traditions. Right, so this is a traditionalist. And then he says, but I'm happy for my Indian natives that are Christian who have worked so long for her uh, canonization. All right, so ambivalence, uh, dislike of the Catholic tradition among his people, but also a, a respect for, uh, for his fellow native Catholics. Right? Well, native people anyway. And um, Darren Bonaparte. Uh, Darren Bonaparte is a really interesting guy. He is a tremendous intellectual. He makes wampum. He writes books. Uh, he's, um, he's just an amazing Mohawk man. He wrote this book called A Lily Among Thorns. It's a book about Cattery. And he says, we are sick of being the thorns. All right, that everyone knows that, that Cattery is called the lily of the Mohawks and that she is the lily and that we are the thorns. We're the thorns in the side of the French, of Western civilization, of Catholicism, and we're tired of being presented that way. And he wrote this book. It's really worth reading. Um, you know, for those of you who are reading my book, read his book. It's way more interesting. He's trying to repatriate her as a Mohawk Indian. So he's telling her story as a Mohawk Indian. He says she's never ceased to be completely culturally Mohawk. He says she was a flesh and blood Mohawk woman. That's the way I want to remember her. He spoke at Colgate in 2016. And I just want to end with some of the things he said. He said, I am not her devotee. He said, my mother is, my family is, I am not a devotee to her. So, okay, fine. And then he said, but she brings a greater power into our life. She is a source of greater power. He says, she brings us to our knees. She teaches us how to pray. He says, she is a connector between, well, he says, where two consciousness, consciousnesses meet, Indian consciousness and Catholic consciousness. I'm not a devotee to her, but he respects her enormously. In fact, he closed his talk at Colgate by saying, God put his finger on earth where she was. And I have to say, isn't that what sainthood is? So I'll end with that, and we'll, uh, we'll have a conversation. Thank you, uh, thank you Professor Vesey. Thank you, thank you. Um, we, we'll use the microphone to uh, ask questions. Maybe we can have like 10 minutes or so of questions. Uh, uh, but we want to use the microphone so that it gets picked up by the uh, recording, okay? So we like to, our, our, our tradition is to have the students ask questions first before anyone else gets a shot. Are there any students that would like to ask Professor Vesey a question based on the talk? Okay, great. Huh? I know, but if you don't, if you don't, you, if you don't use this. <laughs> I can yell too. <laughs> we, want the, we want the question to be on the recording. Um, I was just going to ask about Jake and what his like religious like his him and his family like what their religious like stance was before the miracle. 
So they, they were uh, Catholic people, so Lummi Indians from the very northwestern point in, in Washington, in the state of Washington. Uh, they were both Catholic. The, the mother is Lummi, the father is not, um, but it's a matrilineal society. He is a, he is a Lummi Indian boy, uh, very much devoted to, to the church. And he is now, you know, now what is he? He's 18 or, or so, maybe 18 or 19. And um, he is involved in native Catholic communities, not only in the United States, but in Mexico. He travels to do outreach, Catholic outreach to them. Uh, he, they're a really wonderful family. I, I, I was actually too shy to speak to them uh, in 2012. I just would kind of follow them around and watch them as they were interacting with all these native people. Sometimes you can learn more by just shutting up and, and listening. And I, they just all seem like beautiful human beings. I, I just have to say, beautiful. So you think like your devotion, oh, sorry. So you think like it, this miracle was like, kind of just strengthened the devotion more oh, so oh, than no, because it no was... no question about it. Yeah. You know, there, there are films about them and about Kateri, and you, know, you can look them up. There's a, you know, there's a 50 minute film about, about the Tekakwitha Society, and a lot of it has to do with, with them. There are wonderful um, you know, interviews with them, and the mother, you know, she says, really, I was just furious, you know, like the, my son was going to die and nothing was helping him. And, you know, she describes the coming of, of Sister Kateri Mitchell and I, it's, it's nice <laughs> to say the least. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, other students? Any other students have a question? <laughs> How about any questions? Yeah, any questions, please. Great. Thank you, thank well, you. I'll, I'll work my way across the route to uh, Catherine. Thank you very much. Um, one one thing I had heard, and maybe the, the stuff you were saying at the end um, was interesting in light of this, that one of the reasons I had heard that the canonization process was always held up is because of the internal fight in the Mohawk community and amongst Native Americans. And I just wanted to see if you could speak anything to that. If, if that's an overstatement, it was just a matter of waiting for the miracle, um, or anything along those lines, because it was very interesting to hear that while there's been so much devotion um, over the years, that there is still that kind of internal dispute amongst the Native Americans about this particular issue. Right. I, I can't say anything about the process. I've, I've never heard anyone say that that's what was taking it up. Or, you know, was slowing it down. You know, a lot of Indian people in 2012 said, you know, you know what, what took him so long? You know, what, you know, why, you know, why is this taking so long? It takes a long time for this, for this to happen. I've never heard anyone say that. Um, they've always said we were waiting for the second miracle, and that was really the, the key. So I don't have any, I, I don't have any inside. You know, this is not inside baseball. I can't do it. it, it sorry to disappoint you. I just don't know. You want to say more about it or no? Okay. Yeah, let, let's just leave it. I just, I just have never heard anyone say that. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much for your talk. I um, actually love uh, Kateri. And I work thank you for pronouncing it that way. That shows that we're of a certain age. Oh. Yeah. I, um, I work in a public school. And I have a student who is a teenager. She's an orphan. And um, her life is very bleak. And one day her father came. And uh, he's, he's not very involved in her life, but he did come. And she was so happy that day. And she's not been very happy. And um, I looked at her and I said, why are you so happy today? And she said, because I made my confirmation yesterday. I said, well, really? What did you choose for your name? And she said, Kateri. And so I said, Kateri Tekawitha? And she goes, yes. So we actually had a picture of her at home. And a few weeks later, I brought it to her. And um, her life has been very, very dark and very tragic. And so I had wrapped it in a gift package. And when she opened it up, she pulled it out. And she herself is not very attractive. I think she's very beautiful. but. Um, she herself doesn't think so, and I think other people have had similar thoughts about her. 
but she's very beautiful because her soul shines through so beautifully because uh, she pulled this picture up and when she saw it, she goes, it's Kateri and she's so beautiful. And I think because Kateri doesn't just speak to the Indian, but she also speaks to the orphan and she, she's much more universal in the sense of she speaks to this young lady who, um, who herself comes from another country and um, yeah, so it's just, it was just amazing to me. And my husband said today, oh, you know, it's going to be a talk on her. And I go, well, I don't want to miss that one. So thank you so much. I mean, oh, I'm so thank grateful you. for thank it. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah I appreciate so it. So please pray for her. I would like to ask everybody here to pray for her. Be very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. So, yep. The uh, merger or connection of cultural traditions can be very, very complicated. Uh, I just put one narrow question. To what extent does her, did her asceticism respond to either Mohawk or Native American traditions generally? I mean, she pretty was a pretty extreme ascetic from what you said. In fact, I was under the impression that one, one is not supposed to shorten one's own life uh, by ascetical practices, and she apparently did. Uh, but anyway, uh, was, she, was her asceticism Something just about her, or did it respond to things in her Native American background, particularly the Mohawk? So, um, more men than women in Mohawk society live their lives ready to suffer. Ready to suffer under captivity. And, you know, I remember reading this, this book years ago called Behind the Tree of Peace. And you know the Iroquois present themselves as uh, as people with a peace prophet, the Ganawida, the peacemaker, the bringer of peace, and so forth. And this book uh, by a guy named Snyderman uh, was about uh, behind the tree of peace, and it's about torture. It's about the torture that Iroquois people performed on their enemies, and one was expected to take it, to take suffering and to show that you were strong and in self self control so the kinds of things that she engaged in herself are the kinds of things that iroquois people expect to happen to them when they are captured there was also a cult of virgins among the uh, Mohawk and among other Iroquois people, in which uh, women took uh, vows of perpetual uh, uh, chastity. So what she was doing there was not completely apart from what would happen. And those women who uh, took those uh, those vows, they often engaged in the kind of red whip activity, the red willow. So she, when she was engaging in those activities, she was doing things that were Iroquois. And the eating of ashes is something that Iroquois people do. All right, so there is a combination of, of two forms of uh, treatment of the body, if you will. Fair enough? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I was wondering, maybe I can ask a question myself. Uh, I was wondering what, what... You have you have the microphone, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> I was wondering what, what percentage of Native Americans are Catholic, uh, Professor Vesey? Do you, do you have any number, are there any numbers on that or? 18.3% 18.3 of, of American Indians <clears throat> in the United States are, are Roman Catholic. Oh, wow. Yep. Yeah, so wow. how many is that? That's about... 550,000. Wow. There, yeah, there's a lot of... That's, lot a, of that's a lot. I, that's more than I would have expected. Yep. Yeah. Uh, other questions? I feel great for answering that question. <laughs> uh, you know, like... <laughs> it, it is a setup, right? <laughs> we, yeah. talked we talked before. We talked before. Please, one, one oh, more yes, question. Oh, yes, yes. That last guy you, you showed, um, Tom something. Tom Porter? Tom Porter. Um, yes, this guy. Is that man a Christian? No, he is no, he is decidedly not a Christian. He okay. is a traditionalist. That's the way he would refer to himself. He is the chaplain in New York State for all um, for all prisoners in the state prison. I, I've been in several 
prisons uh, with him where he performs uh, the Thanksgiving address and they perform dances that are traditional uh, Iroquois uh, spiritual and also social dances. So he goes from prison to prison and uh, acts as a traditionalist. When I use that word, it, it's, a, you know, it's a funny word. Uh, you know, there are traditionalist Catholics, right, who, who are, you know, we do it the old way, we do it the right way, we do it the way, you know, we used to do it. Well, there are traditionalist uh, Iroquois who say, we are members of the longhouse religion, and we, uh, we, our liturgical calendar consists of uh, the maple ceremony, which just took place, and the uh, planting of corn ceremony, and et cetera, et cetera. In other words, it follows the, the natural cycle of economic events within the Iroquois community. That's what, that's what Tom Porter is. He's a traditionalist. He's a, you want me to use the phrase? He's a born-again pagan. <laughs> okay, I was, I, was only little I was only a little thrown off because he was in front of a cross. Well, you know, yes, yeah, so this is at Fonda. He's giving that talk. The quotation I made, he was giving that very talk at Fonda when, when, you know, when I quoted him. Yeah. Thank you. It, it is a little strange because there he is. He looks like he's giving a homily at a at a mass, and but he's but he's actually a, a neo or a, a born again pagan, uh, which is hey, little... I already said that. <laughs> right. You've already got. Uh, it's already been. It's already been used. Yeah. Um, actually, I saw I saw a Native American guy at a conference once who had a little pin called that said <laughs> "born again pagan." Wow. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, we just got like a couple more minutes. Make, make a couple more questions. I Chris, am still okay? standing. Wonderful. Maybe you could do quick work with this one. Please. But the um, the sculpture at St. Patrick's. Yes. Can you just tell us a little bit about I, that? I cannot. That was quick. I, no, I, no, I, no. I wish I wish I could. Um, I, I was taken up so much on that day by kissing Bishop Sheen's ring that I, you know, I didn't I didn't do the the necessary research I should have done. This is, this is, thank you. Thank, yeah, if you could, send me, send me a note. Because I've tried to look it up, I tried to Google it, and I have never found who the, who the sculptor was or, or exactly when it was. And for that reason, I almost didn't show it, because I knew you would ask that question. <laughs> Sorry. 18.3. <laughs> That's a great statistic. Yeah. Yes. Wait, uh, I read recently that there's a cause for canonization of black elk. There is. Have you, could you say a little bit about your take on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so for those of you who, um, I'll, I'll have to do a little introduction. So there is, there was a Lakota Sioux man from Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, born in 1863, died in 1950, or maybe a little later, um, uh, named Black Elk. And a book was written about conversations that he had. The book was written in 1932. The conversations he had took place in 1931 with a man named John Nyhart, who was uh, actually one of America's most famous poets in the, in the early part of the 20th century. And it's a book called Black Elk Speaks. And in this book, Black Elk talks about his life but he talks about a particular great vision that he had at the age of nine, where he went into a coma, he went into a trance, and he, and he was taken up into the sky world, and all of the cosmos spoke to him. All of the directions, all of the eagles, the horses danced, and so forth. It's an amazing piece of, of literature. It's a, it's a tremendous spiritual experience that he had. And the rest of his life, he tried to live out that vision with the sacred hoop. And he performed dances with, uh, with these horses and so forth. Anyway, I, uh, enough about about that portion of his life. This book became, has become a spiritual bestseller. Millions and millions of copies of this book have been sold, translated into dozens of languages. Uh, uh, 
scholar wrote an article in a, in a book of mine some years ago called When Black Elk Speaks, Everybody Listens. All right, for those older of you, you may remember there was an ad that, that said something like that. Here's the thing about him. He was a, a Roman Catholic catechist. Right? He was someone who read the Bible in Lakota, uh, not in the Catholic version, but in a, um, a congregational version uh, translated by a guy named Riggs. He knew the Bible inside and out. He converted hundreds and hundreds of Indian people to Catholicism, traveling from reservation to reservation before 1931. And when that book was published in 1932, the Jesuits with whom he worked, I mean, he was a paid catechist, they were furious at him. How could you be talking about your vision, your vision of these pagan things? And um, a couple of years later, they made him sign two recantations. Oh, I have copies of those. Um, in my files, two recantations. I didn't really mean to tell this guy that. I didn't mean this. I didn't mean that, etc. cetera. Um, and I remember visiting a Pine Ridge Reservation in uh, 1988. And I went to the, uh, his, where he's buried in Manderson, um, South Dakota, so on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and I went to the church there, and the priest there said to me, listen, buddy, I just want you to know, he was a Catholic, all right? He was not a pagan. He was a Catholic to the day he died. I said, well, okay, okay, fine. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just writing down what I'm seeing. I, you know, like I'm, not, I'm not taking sides here. But that fight has been going on within his family. He had one son, Ben Black Elk, who uh, was a, a traditionalist. And he had a daughter named Lucy, who was a strong Roman Catholic. And the two of them struggled over who he was. And to this day, there is this kind of struggle that takes place. Who was the real Black Elk? And uh, you know, a new biography came out about him just this past year that I, that I read. It's a big, fat biography of him. I'd say it's going to be the definitive study. And this fellow says, oh, you know, the Jesuits, they treated him like bad. All right? That once they, you know, once they found that he had done this, they isolated him and yelled at him and you know, just really tried to get him to be Catholic. But in fact, the rest of his life, he performed his dances in public at Mount Rushmore. He and his son, uh, you know, like this, there's all of this back and forth. So in the midst of that, one of his great-grandchildren, maybe grandchildren, um, has started a cause for, for his, so it's on, it's on Lucy's side of the family. And, and there is this move to have him canonized as a, as a Catholic saint. It's going to be a very interesting thing to see because, of course, here's a guy who reveled in his, in his traditional religion to the, end of his, to the end of his life. So they're going to have some doing. So there's a wonderful book by a fellow named um, Costello, Damien Costello. He's a Catholic uh, historian. He has taken the great vision. It's called Black Elk colonialism and Catholicism. And he has taken this, this great vision, and he says every word of it comes from the Bible. It's all out of Book of Revelation, et cetera, et cetera. And he does a whole textual analysis trying to show that Black Elk's vision was actually Catholic tradition. And, he, and Damien Costello is the person who is leading the, the drive for his canonization. Have I said enough? Yes. Okay, all right, great. So yeah. Thank you, thank you, Professor Vance. Thank you very much.